Welcome to Suzanne's studio. I'm Suzanne Barnett, your host, and tonight I am so pleased to introduce three internationally pretty famous artists. And these artists are going to show some of their art and they are going to be exhibiting at the Palo Alto uh, Clay and Glass Festival, which is an annual event. And I'm just so pleased that all three of you are here. Should we start with the gentleman? Thank you for Will, inviting us. Will Johnson, tell us about you. Well, I'm... Sorry, sorry. It's okay. Okay. Um, I've been involved in clay for approximately 30 years. Uh, what happened was that I got into it by accident. I was passing the ceramics lab and I said one of these days I'm going to sign up for a fun class. Once I finished with the math and the history and I had time in my schedule, I would sign up for a ceramics class. So I finally got a chance to do that. And once I signed up for the class, uh, I was not able to, I wanted to drop the class. I didn't enjoy the class at all. And I don't know why. Um, it wasn't what I expected. But my instructor probably needed someone in the class mm -hmm. for the class to continue. Mm -hmm. And so he wouldn't let me drop the class. So I was stuck in the class. And so many years later, I'm still playing in clay and enjoying it. And not only that, but you also are doing something very important for other artists. Tell us about that. Well, you know, what, what's happening is that I have uh, been involved with a studio my business partner, Ruben, and I, we opened up Black Bean Ceramic Art Center about uh, six years ago in San Jose. And it's a place where people can come and work. Uh, once they become a member, it's 24-7. They get a key, come in and work whenever they want. And we also teach classes for young kids who want to learn and uh, explore their creative abilities. So it's fun. Well, you have to tell us about your sculpture. It's just gorgeous. It's a ceramic. It is ceramic. Yeah, tell. It, it is ceramic. Yeah. And what's happened was that this is something completely new for me because I had not been doing sculpture before. I've been doing bowls or vases or decorative pieces, mm -hmm. not strictly just for uh, holding uh, plants or flowers, but just strictly decorative pieces. And one day I uh, said, I'm going to orchard supply. I'm going to make a sculpture and I'm going to go find some nails. And so the first ones I did, I uh, put nails in their head as hair and it just kind of snowballed from there on. And so I started doing these and I'm enjoying them. I'm having fun making them. And the pieces are pit fired and you don't know exactly what's going to happen because they're smoldered in sawdust and the carbon from the sawdust goes into the clay body and gives it that smoky effect. So each piece will come out completely different. So it's a surprise. It's always a surprise. And then you made this gorgeous bowl. This piece right here, I've, uh, I've titled it baptismal. And it looks like a baptismal bowl. And with the pebbles, I, there are pebbles, different color pebble, pebbles around. And it reminds me of water. And so it came up to the with the title, I came up with the title Baptismal. And so that's another piece that's also smoldered in sawdust. I start out with a white clay body and the carbon from the sawdust goes into the clay uh, to the piece and gives it that black smoky effect. So it's, each piece will come out completely different. So are you usually excited or disappointed or what? Sometimes <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. Sometimes You're not. I'm not yeah. excited. Yeah. So sometimes a piece have to grow on you. You mm -hmm. live with it for a while and mm -hmm. you say, oh, that's not a bad piece after all. Yeah. Or even if I see a piece of my uh, art in someone's home, like I saw a piece uh, about a month ago in a friend's home and uh, I said, I wanted it back. Can I have it back? And she said, of course, no, you can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to ask all of you my favorite question. Okay. Thank you, Will. How about Miss Carolyn? Um, well, my background has been in art, science, and design. Um, I started doing art from when I was a little girl, uh, but you know, being from a Chinese family, I wasn't really allowed to pursue that. Um, until after I got to college 
And just, How come? Well, it's just for fun, but I thought I was going to go into cancer research. Uh, but after my art professor in college said, you know, he really encouraged me to continue, um, I decided to make the switch, and I've never regretted it. Um, I, I love doing it, um, and since I have a design background, um, I do like to produce things that are functional, um, not always, but definitely can be. Um, it's so it's what the person who wants to live with it, um, how they perceive it. They can it can be something useful in their home, or it could be a, a artwork. But that is so gorgeous. I mean, it doesn't look like it's glass. Why does it look so different? It's different because I have treated the surface of the glass differently. Um, it is uh, an opaque glass, um, not, so not transparent. And I have sandblasted the surface and refired, which gives it a soft and warm satiny finish. It takes off that, that shine. Um, when I first started doing glass, I, I really gravitated towards the, the shiny, bright color pieces um, because they're almost like candy. It but, is. But it's your yeah, red the, piece. the red piece. But with the white one, um, I got to a point where I wanted my glass to have a different quality. And um, I discovered this was a special glass that also has a chemical reaction that I wanted to utilize for the design. And on this side, you can see the very fine gray lines. Yeah. And that gray line was designed into it because I knew this glass had a chemistry that would react with the other glass that I'm using to produce this fine gray line as a detail. Um, and after it's been fired um, on both sides, so a different design can yeah. sort of show through, um, I sandblast the, f the surface and fire it again, and it just leaves it That's gorgeous with a satiny finish. Now, how will you be able to sell that? Because it sounds to me like you're very attached. Um, Would you? The first one, I think I'm I'm always a bit attached to, but uh, you know it takes a bit of practice, and after a while. You want your pieces to be enjoyed by others. So when you see other people appreciate your work, um, I think that makes you feel like you, know, you can let go of it because it will have a, new, a really good new home. That's a nice thing to put it. If I had made that, I wouldn't sell it for anything. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> So April, you've been on the show before. You're a real longtime artist, and you're also you you're a big wheel with the Palo Alto Club. I mean the uh, A. What is it? ACGA. Yeah. Tell what that is. So the Association of Clay and Glass Artists puts on this festival, and I think this is our 23rd year in Palo Alto. Um, I'm the, currently the festival liaison which means I coordinate between the ACGA board and our festival producer, Giant Creative. And it's been a really good collaboration. I really enjoy working with Giant Creative. I've been on the board of ACGA for, oh, almost 16 years or something like that. So I'm, I know my way around the organization. <laughs> and it's going to be say. what, July 11th and 12th? That's right. On Newell Road. Newell and Embarcadero yeah. at the Palo Alto Arts Center, right yeah. across from the main library. Two days, it's free admission. I, I go every year and it's gorgeous, it really is. This, tell all the different items. So we have a whole variety of clay and glass artists, so that's one really fabulous thing is that you can see so many different ways of working with those two media. It's not gonna be the person next to you looks like just the same as what you do. Um, 
there's going to be demos. I think we're having a, a wheel throwing demo, a tile making demo, and two glass bead making demos. Um, and there's also something that used to be called clay for kids, but everybody had so much fun with it, we changed it to clay for all. So people who yeah. want to work with some clay just to get their hands dirty, they can do that. That's going to be in the historic courtyard. And there also will be a members exhibition, which is going to be in the auditorium that for the last couple of years has been the temporary library, but we have the space back now as an auditorium. Oh, that should be very exciting. Okay, how about showing your piece? So That is so gorgeous. This is an example of bright and shiny, and uh, it's copper foil sandwiched between two layers of glass. And I drew the design on a piece of foil. I was actually up on a ridge in Bonnie Doon looking at this grove of huge madrone trees. Gorgeous. And so this is a portrait of that grove of madrones. I would have loved to have made the piece, I don't know, the size of a wall in somebody's <laughs> house, but <laughs> certain limitations um, do apply. And I think your, your story about where you used to live around here, and now you had to go back to the Santa Cruz area. I used to live in Berkeley. Oh, in Berkeley, And then I okay. relocated to, okay. to Felton, yeah. But that's kind of close to uh, that's not too Santa far. Cruz. No, no, I mean the people are, are so artistic. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And tell about this. These are candle screens. They're designed to be a semi-functional, semi-artistic piece, kind of like what Carolyn is saying. You can put a candle behind it, and at night the light will make a pattern on the table and when the flame oh. flickers the pattern will flicker which i find really beautiful to watch but it also can look really good just sitting on a mantelpiece or as a centerpiece on a dining room table um, for me they're really fun because i can keep changing my designs but it's a small format they're not very expensive so i can try all kinds of experiments and this shows a range of my most recent experiments which started with this sort of arch kind of shape with sometimes little flames inside and then kind of moved along to some more African inspired designs and something that's a little more abstract. I don't really know what to call that one. I'd say Art Deco. Okay. <laughs> I'll run with that. to me is Art Deco. I love Art Deco. So these are first fused and then slumped. So just two firings. Now tell what, it, what does fusing mean? Fusing is the process that both Carolyn and I use for making the flat piece of glass where we heat the glass up to high temperature till all the pieces form one body. And slumping is when you put that flat piece on or inside of a mold and let it heat to a lower temperature where it just sags until it fills the shape or forms over the mold. But that has nothing to do with glass blowing technique, does no, it? No, we does are not it? doing glass blowing. Yeah. So the, the difference, well, the difference, I, I mean, I've seen glass blood, but I haven't seen this technique. Why do you happen to like this technique? I like fusing because I can set up my piece while it's cold, mm -hmm. and then I can control the kiln. So it's very technical and exact, as exact as possible, and I can keep taking a look at it and see if yeah. it's done yet. Um, on the other hand, glass blowing is much more in the moment and fluid. So for me, I've tried to find ways to bring back some sense of fluidity, even though it's not going to be happening in the kiln because it's at 1550. I'm not opening that kiln and getting my hands in there. But when I actually cut my glass or when I'm drawing on my metal and cutting the metal, I'm doing that freehand. I'm not using a stencil. I'm doing it by eye. And if I want to modify what I've drawn, I can change the angle of my cutting wheel and, you know, veer off the line if I want to. So that gives me that sense of fluidity and experiment. So uh, do you still use the old time glass cutter? You not, know, with the roller? I used yes, to do but not glass. the stick type. There's a it's, pistol grip type that's oh. much easier to handle. Do you use a pistol grip? I do too. And it's very interesting you bring this up because somebody asked me the other day, um, how to cut glass because he had never had any success with it. And I said, well, you know, those old types that are all metal with the red paint on them and the hardware stores, 
they're just not very good. So I do use um, a pistol grip, but I do also use the ones that are more like a pencil. Um, but you really just need a good glass cutter that has a nice tip. And um, there are some techniques like not going over the line um, twice, which dulls your blade. But when you have a good glass cutter, it, it makes, makes it much easier. Much easier. So they've come a long way from the other kind. I think okay. so. Okay, uh, here's a question that just came to me. Uh, you're a ceramicist. All right. And you have your wonderful studio. What is it like to be an artist? April, I'm going to ask you first. What's it like to yeah. be an artist? Yeah. You're asking for my life story. I know, <laughs> I know of course. I um, you know, I think it's partly about being open to opportunity, being open to suggestion, seeing something, allowing an inspiration to happen, and actually trying it. It's about saying yes instead of saying, no, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. It's about saying, yeah, I think I'll try that next time. It's also about looking at your mistakes, which in a laboratory you'd have to discard, but in, a, in your studio, you come back to it later and you go, well, that isn't so bad. You know, I really like that effect that happened over in this corner. How did that happen? And then you think back, what did I do? How did that happen? And suddenly you find you've invented your own very special technique for producing an effect that you never would have found if you hadn't had a boo-boo in the first place. So I think that kind of openness and experimenting and keeping on trying different things. That's what really turns you on, obviously. That's a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you know what, too, is that you yeah. mentioned about trying things. I, I was brought up by my grandparents, my grandmother, my father's um, uh, mother. And when growing up as a kid, she always says, if I said I can't do something, she would say to me, Mr. Can't died a long time ago. Oh. So that means that don't use the word yeah. can't around me because you can do if you set your mind yeah. to it. Yeah. And so that's what I've been, been, been trained to do. And sometimes I say, I can't do it. Then I think back, no, you can't say that. You, 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 yeah. you need to try it yeah. and experiment and see what happens. You know? So sometimes it comes out great. Sometimes it doesn't, mm -hmm. but at least you've tried. So. So it is definitely attitudinal. It is. Is, it is. That's yes. what, okay, Carolyn. Yes. What inspires you with your art? Wow. Um, I think for me, everything. Everything I ever look at, um, I consider it gets filed away somewhere in my brain. And when I'm looking at something that is that I'm curious about um, like how something was made, um, the color, the shape or form of it. Um, but also, I've been very interested in this new um, philosophy that's come about, um, which is known as STEAM now, which is science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And I'm very, really excited because 3D printing has become um, very popular, and I see a lot of potential in how to incorporate technology with art. And it's probably coming to that anyway with everything is technology today. Is it that is. going to affect your creativity, your, your art, do you think? going to have to change? I mean, I'm asking that as a question. That's a good question. I feel personally that for me to feel like it's my artwork, my hands should be on it. But there's definitely other people who are happy to design the work and have other people's hands make it or machines make it. Um, so I don't know if Gump's ordered a hundred of the same design of something, <laughs> would I use a laser cutter or a water cutting machine to make the template? I probably would because I wouldn't want to do the same thing a hundred times. But otherwise, if it's to be a one-off piece of work, um, I prefer to do it hands-on. That's my personal That's choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, I, I, I don't sit and draw a sketch of the work that I'm doing, you know. It just happens, whatever happens. Whenever I, like when I made the bowl here, 
I didn't realize I was going to be putting the circles around mm -hmm. the edge of the bowl. But once I started, then it just continued. So I never plan it. It just let whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. And then you just always surprised. Things are, and it tends to work out. I never draw the pieces out or sketch it out, but it just happens. It just happens. Yeah, whatever yeah. happens, happens. Well, that's your talent, yeah. obviously. But the life of an artist is tough, right? But you all are internationally famous now. So, was it a hard road, was it, to get there? Well, well you know what, when I, um, when I first started taking ceramics and I say, well, am I going to do this as a career? And I thought, it's a hard, hard to, so I need to eat. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went into education. So I taught U.S. history and world history. Uh, and then during the summers, I would play with my ceramics and do my ceramic work to regenerate my battery to mm -hmm. go back to school in September. Mm -hmm. So it was, mm -hmm. a, it, was, it was doing something different in during the summer. Mm -hmm. But then when school started, I would go back to uh, mm -hmm. my U.S. history and world history. So I guess the best thing one, one could say is that if you can have your avocation turn into your vocation right. and make money, right. that's ideal. It, 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 it would be ideal. Like, I, I admire, I, I've got some friends who have made their livelihood as an artist. And I, it just, it's hard work, but it's dedication, too. Yeah, it's yeah. It's dedication, yeah. so, um, and I, I admire that. Yeah, and, and a lot of luck, too. <laughs> Someone said that, and it irritated me, because I think if you're really talented at whatever, it's your your motivation and the and the actual work and the luck maybe has to come along but it's not the whole thing right right mm -hmm. I, and it yeah, isn't it, it isn't it really isn't anyway we're just about the end of our show and i can't wait until july 11th and 12th and the address is 1313 Newell Road at Embarcadero. Yeah, yeah. And what are the hours? We're open from 10 to 5 both days. Both and we days. have valet parking. And food. And food, too. Oh, good. We have five minutes. Oh, I'm going to ask another very, very provocative question. But I have to think of it. <laughs> um, the life of an artist. T have you ever really been discouraged? I hate to be negative, but I, I would like to ask that question. I would say yes, um, just because it is hard to make a living as an artist. But when you really think about what else you would do, um, or when I think about that and um, think, well, I did have a lot of education, I could do something else. I decide I don't want to do something else. And that smack, snaps me back into getting back to work. So, um, you know, that's sort of like the kick in the butt to, well, to you, like make you, you start have exhibited doing. exhibited at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. I did. That was yeah, early I'd... in my career when I was a designer. Um, but my most recent encounter with the museum was um, that I submitted something to a biennial in Taipei, Taiwan, and, or actually it was in Shinzu, Taiwan, and um, they gave me an award for both my pieces. So I was... Congratulations. Thank you. And that gives me enough juice to keep going. Absolutely. And also, this show, the... Uh, the ceramic, the clay and glass show. It's a jury show, so just somebody, anybody just can't get in. I mean, you have to have talent, background, and so forth, right? I mean, it's, it's a That's gorgeous right. show. It really is. Well, you, you know, too, it's, it's amazing. Sometimes if you're at a show and the people who are walking by and they're admiring your work, 
And sometimes someone probably might say, what was he thinking? And then sometimes other people will say, God, I really like the taste. Yeah. So it's, it's just taste. Different people have just different, different oh, tastes. And, so, um, and it's always nice when someone appreciates your work. Right. And what do they say? Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? So anyway, we are at the close of our show, and I want to thank all of you. Oh, Miss April Zilber, did I get it right? And Margaret Carolyn. Wong. Carolyn. I <laughs> that's got, that's I, okay. You gotta be, your middle name has to be, <laughs> God. That's age, I'm sorry to say. Carolyn Wong. Yes. Okay. And Will Johnson, I thank all three of you, and I'm going to look forward to seeing you at the show. Thank you very much for inviting us. Oh, my it was pleasure. A pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. And you have a wonderful PR person, Miss Kathy, over there. We appreciate her. And yes. I want to thank our crew. We have a delightful crew, and we're all volunteers. Yep. That's great. We're volunteers. Otherwise, I would have gotten a million dollars. <laughs> Maybe in my next life. And of course, I want to thank. I want to thank our audience for watching. And you know something? Truly, I cannot wait to see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank really, you very much. Really Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah. Such a nice. Yeah.